Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining our SCM panel webinar. Uh, my name is Robert Cummings. Um, I'm the academic administrator for the SCM program. Uh, with me today, I have four uh, great students here um, to give you their perspectives on the SCM program, um, highlights of student life, um, academic advice that they've learned so far, uh, and what you can expect from the SCM program. Uh, we will also be taking questions throughout the webinar. Um, so submit in the Zoom chat, and I will happily um, feed them along to the students here. Um, just a quick brief summary. Um, we offer two programs here at SCM, the 10-month residential program uh, and the five-month blended program. Uh, both programs lead to a either a master's in applied science or a master of engineering. Uh, the residential program follows a more traditional path um, with classes and research done in person on campus between September and May. Um, the blended program requires five online courses via the edX um, MicroMasters credential in supply chain management, uh, followed by five months of classes here on campus between January and May. Um, so now we're here in February, um, uh, deep into the program. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to the students to introduce themselves, and um, then we'll go over some questions um, about academic life and obviously ask answer questions from the audience. Um, so Brett, take it away. Uh, hi friends, my name is Brett Elgersma. I'm originally from a very small town in Minnesota. Uh, after my stint in high school, I chose to join the Navy. So I was in the Navy for five years right after high school. Um, and after I got out of the Navy, I went back to college and got a bachelor's degree in supply chain management at Iowa State. Um, after school, I worked for a few years uh, with supply chain systems in an agriculture company in Iowa. Uh, before leaving to pursue my master's here at MIT. Hey everyone, my name is Colleen Copley and I am from a town about 45 minutes south of Boston called Mansfield, so I'm a local. <laughs> um, I did my undergraduate in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech and after graduating that, I worked at GE Power for the last four years on a leadership development program and I am one of the four of us who's on the blended program here at MIT. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Trevor Thompson. I'm actually from Arizona, so I might be the farthest one um, from Massachusetts. Uh, I went to Arizona State University and I got a bachelor in uh, supply chain management as well as in marketing. Then I ended up working in a kind of a weird path. I ended up working at a bank, uh, JP Morgan Chase, for the last three years uh, before coming over here to the uh, residential program. Hey guys, I'll round us out. I'm Tony Orr I'm from Indiana. So yes, Trevor, you were the furthest away from here originally. Um, Boston's home for me now, but um, I did my undergrad in industrial engineering at Purdue University. Following that, I went and worked with PepsiCo in a, in a leadership development program as well. Um, did that for two years and then decided to pursue my master's here at MIT through the residential program. So I will get the ball started with um, a few questions that I had prepared. Um, first one is, what led you to make the decision to attend MIT? A decision hopefully lots of students can make. <laughs> so I actually uh, didn't learn about this program until uh, the last semester of uh, my senior year in undergrad. And I learned about um, the school that I went to sponsored a supply chain excellence program that I applied for and actually won. Um, even after I won that uh, ex Supply Chain Excellence Award, I wasn't totally sure that I was gonna come to MIT. Uh, but after working for a few years in industry, I um, was really looking for another challenge and I knew that I wanted to get beyond um, sort of uh, procedural roles and wanted to get more into uh, working with people and developing ideas and processes and things like that. <clears throat> and I remembered about this convenient award that I won <laughs> and um, did a lot more research on the program here at MIT. And it just really seemed like the right fit uh, to help me take my career to the next step that I wanted to take it to. So I learned about this program through my company. Um, we have the leadership development program, like I said, and it was one of the things they recommended we pursue um, just because it is such a great school and such a great opportunity. My leadership program was very focused on operations and manufacturing and being here is really giving me the layer of supply chain and strategy that I didn't get as much. So it's been really, really great to 
be able to make the decision to come here with all these great people. Um, and definitely the, the people and the layers I didn't have in my career yet that I could get that educational foundation on was the reason for me. <laughs> um, so mine was similar to Brett at the beginning. Uh, during my senior year at uh, ASU, I actually heard about the Supply Chain Excellence Award. I was also one of the winners, and then Tony's going to repeat that again. Um, so that got the ball rolling. I actually took my first attempt of the GMAT my senior year, um, the first of two, because I had to retake it. Um, you should study. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but at that point, I, was, I knew I wanted to do three years in a master's, either an MBA or a master's program. I want to be a professor one day, so I wanted to that factored in my decision because I want to teach supply chain management and it made more sense for me to come to a specified degree like this. Um, I also, my learning curve sort of stagnated after a couple years um, working in operations and then I realized I wanted to switch industries and sort of get that technical knowledge back that I sort of had lost um, from being out of school. And the final thing that sold me was actually coming here about a year before school started and just sitting in on a couple of classes and seeing campus and it was just a phenomenal experience. So. It's been worth it. So like Brett and Trevor, I did learn about the, the program prior to even considering attending. So I was, I was a Supply Chain Excellence Award winner as well, um, my senior year at Purdue. And for me, this transition made sense to move from my career as an individual contributor to more of a, a manager or a team-based collaborative role. Um, so part of the development that I was going through in my career and in industry was uh, stepping through different roles within operations and strategy to figure out where I could best contribute, but then also understanding where as a leader that next step for me was. So developmentally, this really made sense for a one-year program. It was either this or B school for me, which I think everybody in the program would say the same thing. Um, but this program just resonated being ranked number one in the world. is kind of a, it's a pretty good selling point. Um, also these, the, the crew of pe people you get to network with and go to class with are also a great um, selling point for this program as well. Uh, so moving on to um, some of the academic components of the program, uh, what would you say is your favorite class so far and why? I know we just started classes the spring term, so it's a tough one. <laughs> so my, yeah. Okay. So my favorite class so far has been system dynamics, which might sound a little weird. Um, so system dynamics is, was developed here at MIT and for me, it was just a completely different way of thinking. It was, um, I think a lot of times in my previous life, it's you make the best decision today without thinking about the repercussions tomorrow and system dynamics, whether you're talking about business or healthcare, uh, any sort of anything, there's uh, system dynamics in almost every aspect of your life. And when you think about the consequences of the actions or the policies that you implement and think about what the long-term ramifications would be, it uh, leads you to think a little bit differently, so. I'm gonna say a MicroMasters one, because I know you guys haven't done that. <laughs> um, so I think my favorite course, because I just got here uh, about a month ago, because I did the blended program, um, but my favorite MicroMasters course was SC4X, where we learn a lot about um, digitization and machine learning. Um, for me, I was doing a little bit of that in my role at the time while I was taking the MicroMasters, and it was really difficult for me to grasp what we were doing as I was learning it. Um, but having the SC4X foundation under my belt really was able to help me challenge certain perspectives, understand where maybe the digital team and the operations team weren't agreeing, and be able to help them kind of knock down some barriers that were up at that point. Um, so that really broaden my horizons to understand how things like digitization that are really going to be disruptors in supply chain um, factor into a very operational and manufacturing role that I was in at the time. Sorry. <laughs> that was much fancier than my answer. Um, so actually a lot of the core supply chain classes are in the spring, so we've just started a lot of those. And I'm actually going to go with the class that's not supply chain because I think that's a big part of the program like you do have all these core supply chain classes but you can still make it your own experience just like an mba you might not be here for two years but you can still i've taken five or six classes outside of supply chain um, and last semester i think my favorite class was global politics um, and economics and that was because i was completely ignorant of the subject and um, 
the the people like who are actually the professors uh one of them negotiated nafta with trump and uh the other one was uh somebody who'd worked in like the world economic forum and had all this experience and so every single class i was just getting blasted with knowledge that i probably should have known some of and then i realized how ignorant i was on you know just everything um and it was just a very enlightening class very fun and uh I'm expecting that might change this semester, um, particularly looking forward to procurement and sustainability. So we'll see. But. So I'll be the one that speaks to an actual supply chain class since that's the program we're in. Uh, <laughs> no, but they, they, they all talk about very good program or class you can take outside of supply chain as well. For me, as previously mentioned, learning that management step and how supply chain actually impacts the, the bottom line and the finances of the business. So supply chain finance in the fall um, with Jim Rice was one of my favorite courses. He does go teach that at the Scale Network as well. Um, but I think it's foundational to understand how all of the decisions that we make within the supply chain organization actually influence what finance has to report out for, for the business. And I think for us coming from a strategical and tactical operational background into this program, I guess I speak for myself on this one, um, understanding what that meant in terms of dollars moving through the business and how I could really drive savings and, and that sort of thing. So supply chain finance for me was my favorite course in the fall. Well, it's yet to be determined for the spring. Uh, excellent. So uh, moving away from academics and thinking of um, some of the experiences you've had at MIT, uh, what uh, opportunities have you explored either in Boston, the MIT community that you would recommend? Yeah, so one thing different about me than the other three is I, I have two-year-old twins here, so um, my extracurriculars look a little bit different, but <clears throat> I think the really cool thing about being in Boston is that there's something for everybody. Um, there's plenty of fun to be had, but if you have a family or if, depending on what you're interested in, there's a lot of museums, there's a lot of history here. Uh, when the weather is nice, there are a ton of parks and um, just trails. It's a very active city. So I think something that I've gotten really interested in is actually just exploring the different, the different parks in Boston and taking my kids to go see different parks and things like that. So. so one of my favorite things since I only got here about a month ago was how welcoming the residential class was to the blended class. Um, they have so many groups for so many different things. Um, we have a basketball group, we have a wine club group, we have a trivia group, we have all these different groups of just different cohorts of people who enjoy different things. Mm -hmm. And it was overwhelming to be invited to these 20 different groups we have on Telegram um, with our whole class. So that's been really fun, just meeting people and getting to know them in those kind of um, classification settings. Like we had a wine night last night and it was great. And I met a bunch of new people and got to know everyone better. So really leveraging what the residential people learned in the fall while I wasn't here um, has really helped us fit in much quicker, I think. Yep. Yeah, I was at the wine, wine night too. That was very fun. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I'm going to go with something sort of academic, but sort of not. Um, so we all, while we're here, we have to do a thesis or a capstone, and I'm doing a capstone. And mine's very unique in the sense that I'm not working with a big company. I'm actually working with small businesses in Latin America. And my partner and I actually got to travel out to uh, Bucaramanga, Colombia last semester and stay there for four days. And we got to shadow local companies. We got to actually give a presentation in Spanish where I had a script because I don't know Spanish. Um, and it was awesome. It was great. I got to meet so many different people. We got to see how business works really for, you know, 99% of the people in Latin America. Um, and it was just a great experience. Um, and there are awesome opportunities like that. Some people went to Switzerland and uh, where did you go? Yeah, he went to Switzerland, um, and someone went to France as well. So some really cool experiences where you get to travel. So I'll speak a little bit on extracurricular activities that sponsor through the school, because I think being back in academia, that's one thing. Coming back out of industry, understanding that school is also trying dynamic and bringing in your networking experiences. So um, I'm actually helping helping organize the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, which is a world-renowned conference that they ho they host every year in Boston. Um, my passion outside of academia and supply chain is sports 100%. It's what I do with the majority of my time when I leave here, aside spending time with my newlywed wife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah. Um, but there's just, there's abundant op amount of opportunities to get involved here on campus. I think there's over like 800 student led organizations you can get involved in. There's, there's little niches for every single interest that you could potentially have. Like Colleen mentioned, our class being 86 now, um, is very close for about a month of knowing each other. That's, that's because we share interest. Um, but also the opportunity to network through MIT 
outside of just the supply chain program, I think is one of the vital things that you can do outside of academics and classroom work that uh, is a cool opportunity here. Uh, so one more question. Um, what piece of advice would you tell a prospective applicant or an incoming student that you wish you would have known when, uh, when you came? <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> well, just my personality, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I'm a, I'm definitely a planner. So I like things to be well known ahead of time, uh, which is antithetical to the way that MIT do does things. <laughs> as far as the administrative process at MIT, everything's kind of last minute, um, maybe by design. Um, so it's probably totally different than any other education experience that you've ever had. I remember freaking out when I didn't, you know, found out I was getting into MIT, but I didn't have a housing lined up and I didn't have all my classes selected and all these things. And um, an interesting thing about selecting classes is actually you register for classes after they start almost. So <laughs> not quite, but it's pretty close. So um, one thing that I wish that I would have known prior to even applying to MIT was uh, just relax. MIT knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, it's hard to change overnight and not stress out, but everything's going to work out fine because uh, I'm I, I stressed out, but I'm still here and I'm making it. So oh, this is a good question. This is a hard question. Um, I would say my my one piece of advice is come in with a couple different things that you expect to get out of the program and expect them to change. Um, because when I came here, I was like, I'm going to get great academics. I'm going to take great classes. I'm going to have a great job. But really what I, you know, those are all great too. But really what I'm, what I'm learning is, like, <laughs> what I'm learning is like, I'm going to meet great people. I'm going to experience great new things. I'm going to really broaden my horizons socially with leadership, all these different things. So I would say what I thought I was gonna get out of this program um, was very kind of like what you can read online about MIT, very like on paper, this is an excellent program. But what I'm realizing I'm getting out of it now is just so much more and very different than what I expected and just being open to that and being excited about that. Aline kind of stole my thunder there because um, <laughs> I agree with everything you just said. Um, aside from studying for the GMAT or taking the MicroMasters in order to get in, um, I'd say one thing that I wish I knew was that, um, at least personally, I really wanted to get a good balance of meeting people and taking classes. And I took 67 credits last semester, which is a lot. You only need to take 45 a semester. Um, I did fine. Um, I think I would have chosen maybe some different classes at the beginning because I was focused on, okay, you know, instead of what do I really want to take? What am I really interested in? I was like, oh, I, I need to take this, you know, for one particular aspect of my career. But one thing I've heard from all the alumni, from all the guest speakers, from my own experience is uh, have fun and do what you want to do. You know, take the classes that will help you, but also take a couple of fun ones. I'm taking leading and ambiguity in, a, in the next half, and I'm very excited for that. Um, so just, you know, really maybe step out of your comfort zone, do a couple of classes you really want to do or think you would challenge you. So I'm going to be the summary guy because everybody's already taken all the good ones. But I think I think if we look at this common theme is that's perspective and balance is something that we we try and keep in perspective with each other throughout as we go. There's so many things that you want to do when you're at MIT. You're back in school. It's one of the best universities you can go to in the entire world. Uh, you're you're with 86 new people that have diverse experiences, and there's so much knowledge to be shared, and there's so many classes you want to take and get involved extracurricularly and balance with family life and everything else and do the city. So in 10 months for us, residential, and five for blended, um, I think one thing that I would stress if you're considering the program and wanting to get involved is, is understanding where your balance point is. Um, I think it's very common with graduate programs that burnout is a conversation that a lot of a lot of students have with each other with adv advisors and um, and sponsors so um, just finding that balance for yourself understanding what you want to get out of this program I think that's a great point coming here knowing I want to get this this and this for me it was finance management and leadership I mean that's where I want to go with my career but also now I'm as I reflect and you look back it's all these other things that you didn't expect to get that you're, you're actually really enjoying so um, just finding that right sense of balance and spending your time wisely I think is one of the is a key stressor for some of us here Uh, well, we have a few questions from the audience uh, that we'll take a stab at uh, answering. Um, so one first one was, um, 
are there any students with 10 plus years of work experience or what sort of work experience do you have? Um, so I will say um, in terms of the two programs, the residential program um, is geared towards um, younger professionals with maybe um, two to two to seven years of work experience or two to five years of work experience. Um, the blended program is an opportunity um, for non-traditional candidates with a lot more work experience to apply. Um, so that's definitely an avenue. Um, do any of you have want to share basically your work experience up until now um, before you came to the program? I, I never know how to answer the work experience question because since I was in the military, military for five years, does that count or that not? Counts, that count. Then I had eight years of experience <laughs> before coming in. Uh, yeah, I'm one of the elders of the group. Of the residential group, that's true, yeah. yeah. Of the residential group, but um, I mean, everybody's, yeah, has a different experience. So coming from the blended group, I think I'm probably the youngest in the blended group, if not like the second youngest or maybe the third youngest, but um, most of the people have 10, 15, 20, like crazy amounts of experience. And um, Trevor talked a little bit about the capstone project, my capstone project. Um, I'm actually partnered with another blended student and he has 25 years experience. So mm -hmm. that relationship has been excellent because being peers with someone on his level has been such a great opportunity for me to learn from him. But also there's so many things that he hasn't seen in so long that I'm seeing in my, you know, less director level role that we're able to kind of like vibe with each other and really help each other bridge gaps and knock down barriers that we have in our capstone project. So um, it's really great for me to have experience and exposure and networking with people so experienced. But I think if we had an experienced person here, they would probably say the same, getting to learn from the younger people, the younger generations, um, and see what we're inspired by, see what we're getting excited about. It's really great to kind of blend the two experience levels. Um, I'll probably be pretty brief. I have three years of work experience, Tony as well too. Um, but I will say one thing uh, that's been really amazing is that there are these people, sort of what you said, um, that have a lot of experience. There's actually someone who's in a C-suite of a company, um, which is phenomenal um, to learn from them. And these people are from all over the world. So you have the different ages, but you also have the different perspectives and different backgrounds that make learning just so exciting. And just talking to, them, talking to everybody, um, even though Tony's younger than me, I've learned a lot from him. It's only one year, but like, imagine, you know, I imagine the same thing for the people who've been working for 10, 15 years. Um, so yeah, yeah, awesome experience. People from all different backgrounds and ages. And, uh, you know, they, we even have a professor here, somebody who's uh, been a professor to, uh, yeah, in academia, and she's here now getting her own master's degree. So nothing will limit you um, from coming here. So yeah, as aforementioned, I am probably the youngest or one of the youngest in the entire program only having two years work experience. Um, but I think that gives me per, uh, opportunity to help being so recent and fresh out of even undergrad, understanding very little about industry and what I was impacting and now being able to, like she said, network with people that have been doing it for 25 years. I'm only 25 years old. So like those kind of opportunities are so unique in life to be able to work, like you said, as a peer with somebody like that, rather than having that be up the ranks in a company and having to try and connect that way. Right. So, and these kind of opportunities in life um, don't present themselves very often for you to be able to network and work with people and ask questions of different backgrounds, industries. Um, I don't remember the exact count of countries that we have represented in the entire program, it's but it's over 40 countries represented in 86 individuals. I mean, I think that's a, that's an incredibly unique opportunity just to, to understand cultural barriers and differences and, and approaches to problems and things of in supply chain that we take for granted here that in other places are very ex extravagantly different. I'm sure you've seen working with your capstone. So um, I think, yeah, the work experience, the diversities, everything that this, this program offers is, is top notch. Uh, so one more one question um, for Trevor uh, in particular is uh, you mentioned your future academic aspirations, possibly doing a PhD. Uh, would you elaborate like what you, what that would look like for you? <laughs> yeah, no, great question. Um, sort of taking a step back, um, I've always wanted to, I've always liked being a mentor. I've liked, I, I've taught some classes at undergrad level. Um, so I've always known that's my passion, but I don't want to teach from just a uh, textbook. I want to teach from experience. So I'm not 100% certain what area of supply chain I would want to teach or if I would want to do more introductory level. Um, but my plan is, you know, I got my three years. I'm getting my master's degree now. Um, again, part of, part of the reason I didn't get an MBA because um, 
a lot of the senior leaders I talked to and the people who are professors nowadays, they got specified degrees in the discipline they were going into. My plan is to work for maybe 10, 15 years, um, then probably do a PhD while I work um, and maybe teach in the evenings. That's sort of been the path I've seen other people take. Um, I think this master's program will help me specifically coming from like ASU, which is a, a really good supply chain program, um, but this is the best supply chain program for a master's program um, at that level. Um, so it sort of sets me apart from other people. And then it'll help me get into the PhD program I would like, hopefully, probably wherever I am, because I would like to do it in person, even if it's on the evenings or weekends, and then eventually teach, um, you know, probably part-time until I retire and then, and then go full-time from there. Sounds great. Um, so now we have, I'll address some specific questions to each of you. Um, one is more geared towards Colleen as you've done the blended program. Um, while you were pursuing the online MicroMasters, how did you juggle working or did you have a full-time job at the same time? Um, how was yeah, that? <laughs> that's a great question. So yes, I had a full-time job at the time. And I think um, that's honestly one of the benefits. You also only pay one semester tuition, which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, working full-time and taking the master's course at the same time, I think the MicroMasters is paced really well. So you only take one class at a time. And each class gives you really clear expectations on how many hours per week you need to dedicate to it. Um, and it's also kind of based on your background. Some classes, I would take me 30 minutes and I'd be done with the homework. And I was like, Thank, great, I have so much extra time this week. But some classes I would need to really dig in on because it's new to me, like the finance um, like unit we had was completely new to me. So I took you know, up to 10, 15 hours that week to really make sure I understood it. Um, so it's really kind of, a balancing act what you have time for with your full-time job but also knowing what you have coming ahead and be like oh that finance unit I know I'm gonna struggle so I need to make sure I can free up some time for myself that week um, but also you do get breaks in there with the classes so you know if you have you know you're going on vacation for a week and you don't want to bring your computer with you you have two weeks to complete every assignment so it's very flexible in that way you can catch up if you get behind you can also get a little bit ahead if you want to as well um, so definitely I think most people in the blended program work full time um, and you can continue to make a salary while you're getting your <laughs> master's. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a balancing act and it's kind of individual based on your background. Uh, great. Um, so now I have a question geared more towards uh, Brett and Tony. Um, moving to MIT with spouses or children, how did you balance that, that family life um, here at MIT? using MIT's resources even. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm not going to, yeah, steal Josue's thunder uh, for when you guys get here. I'll give you a great speech. But um, there's so much to do at MIT that uh, it's really a, just a, a good lesson in prioritization, right? So there's so many things you can do. You can, you can, study all day and all night and get straight A's. You can um, go out and party and have fun and squeak Still by A's. with yeah, <laughs> B minuses. Um, you can take part in all the extracurricular sports and do all that stuff. For me, um, I find myself balancing between three things. I try to be a really good student. I don't want to squander this opportunity to be at MIT, so I take uh, academics very seriously. Um, I also uh, take the friendships that I'm building very seriously because they're this is my new family for life, and and then I have my actual family that's here, my <laughs> wife and my two kids. So I try to um, always prioritize uh, spending time with my kids while they're awake, while I'm not in class or studying, and then after they go to bed, if I uh, have more work to do, then I just. I can sacrifice for a year and stay up late and get by him a little bit of sleep to try and make all the ends meet. So I, that's my personal way of approaching it, but I don't think there's one right or wrong way. I'm sure. You still come out though. You still make I try to. Well, like you I said, right. friends, friends are important <laughs> to me. So. so I've learned a lot from Brett because uh, Brett's been married significantly longer than I have, seeming that I got married in June. Um, <laughs> of last year and moved here in July for this program. So it's been a very fast paced learning curve for me in terms of about that part, the prioritization of school and now family life, right? So I'm, I'm, we're, our dynamic is very new and fresh. And I think being in Boston in a new and fresh environment has definitely helped us that with that transition. Um, she's in a gap year between some of her academics. So it's, she's been very supportive of this program for me, which is something that I really needed. 
um, but also being able to learn from some of the other families, i.e. the one sitting at the other end of the table, learning how their dynamic works, some of their past experience as a married couple. Um, because you, I did, we uprooted our lives and moved to Boston, and it's the first time we've been living together in close proximity. And so we're going through a lot of new things together while doing MIT, while doing extracurriculars and all of the other things that, that pull your time away. But for me, um, my biggest priority is my wife right now. And I, 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 I try and live by that when I go to school and everything else. So yes, yeah, sacrificing sleep is something that I'm more than happy, happy to give up right now for, uh, to build out that family life at home. Can I add one more thing? Sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, the only thing I'm going to add is um, really for me, I, one of the first questions was why MIT? And for me, I've said this from the beginning is that uh, for me, coming to MIT is a lot to do with my family. I want my kids to have as good or a, a better life than I ever had growing up. Um, so my wife and I, we sold our house. We moved our kids uh, 1,200 miles away from their grandparents. Um, and we went from a three-bed, two-and-a-half bathroom house that we were extremely comfortable in, had a great job. But we gave all that up because I knew that coming to this program would give us an even better life yet. It's, I think that just kind of speaks to um, the positives and the benefits and my belief in this program. So. So, so from a blended perspective, too, um, a lot of the people, since you're only here for five months, a lot of the blended people um, are not, their significant others did not move with them. Um, so my husband lives in a different state right now. Um, there's a lot of blended people who have significant others and kids that are in different states. So because it's more abbreviated, um, you can you can kind of get away with saying, I'm gonna disappear for five months <laughs> and go you know, increase our family's you know, opportunities for success yeah. by doing this. So um, I think you can definitely uproot your family, especially if you're here for a year, that would kind of stink to be away from them for so long. But a lot of the blended students, we do um, live remotely from our significant other for these five months. Uh, and then just piggybacking off of that question, um, how have, have any of you utilized MIT's campus housing and has that helped in any way? <laughs> Great question. So I live, um, I live in Eastgate family housing. I have a two bedroom apartment there, which is nice since there's four of us. Um, and Eastgate is awesome because it's literally across the street. So when um, other people come in in January shivering from their bus ride that they had to take to get here. I'm still nice and warm. <laughs> and yeah, and Tony is jealous. I, Tony is jealous. Um, I live off campus. So I tried the on-campus thing, but because I moved out here very prior to the program starting in August, I moved in July. So campus housing wasn't available yet. So I went through the off-campus process and I actually live in Boston. Um, my mornings are not as flattering as Brett's where he gets up <laughs> and walks two minutes to class, I get up and I have a 45 minute commute um, on public transportation, which to me has not really been too much of a transition. I mean, I, I consider it as part of a commute to work when you all commute to work every day. So there's at some point in time you are traveling. Um, it's just trying to find the right priorities to set when I'm on the T, trying to figure out what I can do and be productive, like talking to Robert some days when we get on at the same time. <laughs> um, but I think the, the on-campus on housing, MIT's got all the resources you need. Um, I'll let Trevor speak to it a little bit more since he does also live on campus. Fun fact, Trevor got nominated as the president of his graduate living dorm last night, <laughs> even though he's not going to be here next year. <laughs> yeah, friends. Um, I wasn't even there when that happened. Um, but yeah, so I, I live in a, I've been here for six months now, seven months now, and uh, I live in the Sydney Pacific dorms, um, and a lot of the dorms are like right next to each other. She lives in the dorm right next to me. She'll talk about it. Um, it's it's really nice. It's actually the biggest bedroom I've ever had. It's the smallest bed I've ever had. <laughs> Probably makes the bedroom look bigger. Um, but really, it's not that bad. I mean, the the particularly where I am, there's a gym that's like really nice. They have pool table, ping pong table, a ton of events. I mean, every single week, every single Wednesday actually. So tonight they have free food at 9 p.m. You can go and get a bunch of fruit and stuff and people bring, you know, people bring uh, Tupperware for lunch the next day and uh, just a ton of events, movie nights, things like that. Um, really nice people, laundry, everything's right there. So it's convenient. It's a little more expensive than I'm used to. Again, I'm from Arizona. So very, very big different uh, living conditions, but, but it, I definitely don't regret the decision. I think living on campus was, was the move to make. So yeah, I live in Ashdown, um, which is also a graduate dorm right next to Sydney Pacific. Um, very similar, but I'll say if you want to live on campus, you can really 
tailor it for what you want. So I live in a three bedroom, um, all female room. So we, there's three single bedrooms and we share a bathroom. Um, some people have their own room completely to themselves, their own bathroom, their own kitchen. Some people have two, some people have four. I think it even goes up to like, some rooms have four, but then you have a shared bathroom with your whole floor if you really like to share with people. Um, so it's really specific based on what your budget is and what, what your, your expectation of living is, I guess. Um, so there's a lot of different options to live on campus. What else do you have besides the bar? Oh yeah, we have a bar in Ashdown, which is really nice. And they have a cafe in Sydney Pacific. And there's like trivia night, karaoke night. It's very um, community oriented. <laughs> I think just to give you an idea of, I'm not sure what the blended statistics are, but I think for the residential students, there's 44 of us, and I think roughly 85 to 90 percent of people live on campus. So it's a popular, as a Trevor alluded, because of the expense of Boston, sometimes living close to campus but not on campus can be very costly, and MIT, um, as you've probably heard, offers some really flexible options and affordable options. So. Yeah. Uh, so, next question. <laughs> um, this is more of an academic-based question. Um, someone just based in general, how important would you say the con the supply chain analytics online course was in preparation? Mm -hmm. um, I know you've all actually taken you've it taken to it. some level. So, <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> um, how important was it? I, um, it's actually really important, I think. Uh, the, the concepts that are discussed there are really foundational for a lot of other classes that I've taken. So um, as you come here and as you're successful here, you'll learn about all the great initiatives that are actually taking place in the Center for Transportation and Logistics. Uh, for one of my classes this semester that's going on right now, I'm taking a class uh, called Urban Last Mile Logistics with uh, Dr. Matthias Winkenbach. He's a very, very smart man. Uh, but that is the first four classes of this uh, series has been heavily focused on optimization algorithms and uh, figuring out the most efficient way to get things to customers in the last mile. And without uh, the analytics course up front, it would just be staring at a bunch of Greek letters that I had no idea what they meant. So. For me, it was uh, extremely helpful because it's allowed me to have that foundational understanding and move on to topics that I'm really interested in and really want to learn more about. So again, I've only been here a couple weeks, but one of the classes I have right now is supply chain planning and it's very case study based. Um, so they'll send out the content like, oh, here's your reminder of you know, inventory planning strategies or something like that. And you have your reading, you study the case and you come into class and you talk about it the whole time. So because professors are able to jump right in and have that assumption that you have had the analytics exposure and you at least know, maybe you're not good at it yet, but you at least know the, the strategy behind it really makes the courses here on campus be able to get into a more um, applicable and actually real life scenario. So all the case studies we have are real companies, real data, real problems. And you're like, okay, that analytics class I maybe struggled through, here's how it applies and here's how it's relevant. And it kind of makes it come full circle. So it's really important. You don't necessarily have to be excellent at it, um, but definitely making sure you understand how it can apply to real life situations. When you come on campus, it'll make a lot more sense. Yeah, I'm definitely not the analytics person. Um, I'm a people person. Uh, if you take a personality test, I'm a woo, which means I just love people. Um, and so one of my least favorite classes in undergrad was statistics. And this was a very statistics focused um, course. And it, again, reinforced that I'm not an analytics guy, but also um, I learned a lot from it. Um, like I'd probably forgotten everything I learned from undergrad and this was a lot more intense. Um, we had to take it while we were working. So I guess we all did that um, similar way. It was very difficult. Um, we were also taking a Python course at the same time. So it was all kind of coming together, but very important um, sort of what you guys alluded to. All of the topics we covered were reiterated in like our logistics systems class. I'm sitting in on supply chain planning right now. It's the exact same thing. Um, so again, very applicable, very helpful, um, especially when it comes to interviews. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people are interviewing right after taking that course, and that was very helpful in them sort of impressing the interviewers with, with the knowledge they had about analytics.
So they've all talked about the content and how important it is. And I believe the course is important, but I also think the course helps set a precedence for learning at MIT. For us that are transitioning back into academia, that course was kind of your first real breadth of what MIT was going to offer. Um, and that learning experience is kind of similar to some of the courses we ended up taking in the fall for residentials. You have an online portion that you that that content's available for you at, at your disposal, but the expectation is that you come to class and you already understand it. Because like Colleen mentioned, classes are more for in-depth conversations, real world, app, real world applications, um, advancing that learning and knowledge that you can get on your own. So I think SC0X or the analytics course um, kind of helped me transition back into how does MIT teach and get content across because it's different than what I did in undergrad. Um, and then it also kind of set the precedence for what my expectations were in terms of difficulty level and stuff that you're going to see coming your way for the next 10, five or 10 months, depending on how long you're here. Uh, great. So I'm going to package a few of these questions together, focusing more on the application side. Um, you guys can feel free to chime in, but I'll just give my uh, point of view. Um, so one question is, what key factors does MIT consider when reviewing applicants? Um, one question was, how important is the supply chain analytics in order to apply? And another is, what um, financial aid we offer? Um, so as we mentioned, actually, supply chain analytics is um, is an important component. Um, for the blended students, it's required. Um, and it's one of the, the foundational courses that we consider when reviewing on the admissions committee. Um, for the residential program, it's an option to waive out of the GMAT or GRE. Um, we feel that it's a good indicator of your, um, your abilities, your statistics, your math abilities. Um, so we, that's why we've elevated it to the level of um, waiving out of the GRE or GMAT. Um, Regardless, for residential students, um, even if you do continue with the GRE or GMAT, you would still have to take uh, SC0X um, in order to enroll. Um, so it is, a, although it is a big time investment, it is worth worthwhile in the end, um, and it is a, a large factor in the application process. Uh, in terms of financial aid and support, um, since we're a master's program, we have limited uh, financial support available, um, but we do have very specific avenues. Um, as Trevor and Tony mentioned, um, we have the Supply Chain Excellence Award for, and Brett, <laughs> we have the Supply Chain Excellence Award um, through various schools, um, but for the general population of applicants coming, uh, we do have uh, a pool of funding available both for students in need, for merit-based, um, and also um, we have a, our, um, our Hallmark Award um, for um, diversity, um, reaching out to women in supply chain, um, which we give out each year a full scholarship, um, or full fellowship um, from MIT uh, in January. Um, so there are definitely opportunities for everybody when you apply, um, you would be automatically be considered for um, financial support. Uh, and then finally, the question about um, what are the key aspects of, um, that we look for when you are applying. Um, for the blended program, um, your performance on the MicroMasters is one of the most critical pieces that we evaluate. Um, for both programs, it is also um, a holistic view of both your letters of recommendation. Um, your video statement plays an important part um, uh, in sort of selling why you want to go to the program. Um, maybe those uh, trigger some memories. <laughs> um, uh, yep. And um, the other components that we have, like I said, your letters of recommendation, um, your test scores are particular importance, um, and then your transcripts from your undergrad. Um, we want to make sure that um, MIT is a good fit for you um, because it is a very rigorous process, as the students have all alluded to here. Um, so we want to make sure that you have the strong base um, to begin the program here. Um, so that's a big component as well. Um, any thoughts from the panel? I don't know if this is, if you do this intentionally or if it just happens by accident, but it seems that um, there's a really diverse group of work from a work experience perspective. So it's not all industrial engineers and it's not all undergraduate supply chain majors. I mean, there's um, all sorts of uh, education, uh, backgrounds and also work history backgrounds and I don't know if that's by design or by accident. Yes and that one I forgot <laughs> to mention that uh, even um, one of the top three um, pieces of um, information that the admissions committee 
takes into consideration is your CV, your resume, and your work history. Uh, as Brett mentioned, um, we have applicants from a wide variety, both in terms of work experience, supply chain experience, um, but also branching out far beyond. Um, we always comment that we've had um, we had students with varying degrees as well. It's not everybody coming in with either business or engineering. Uh, we've had a few philosophy majors in the past, fine arts. So it really is, um, really is a diverse group um, that everybody can find sort of an avenue um, in supply chain. Yep. Um, so looking at the questions here, and as we get closer to the end, uh, one more question that came in back on the student life part is, um, in terms of finances, living in Boston, we know it's expensive. Uh, do you have any recommendations on um, basically how, how you saved or what you do now to sort of keep, um, keep things under control? <laughs> any thoughts? If you get involved, there's lots of free food. <laughs> 100%. So we have a lot of, even you know, within our program, there's a lot of speakers, a lot of companies that will come talk to us and there'll be lunch sometimes for those um, sponsors of the program that will come in. Um, you can go to other programs, networking events, and they also have food. You can go to your graduate dorms, or your friends' graduate mm -hmm. dorms events, and they have food. You get involved in activities, and they have food. So food's probably the most expensive yeah. thing other than housing, but there's lots of free food if you want to kind of chop a little bit off your budget there. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question to be thinking about before you come here because you are a student again. So having that mindset definitely helps you get in the right um, – frame of mind but for I mean I live in Boston so the, the on-campus stuff that happens in the evenings I don't typically get to take advantage of but your MIT student ID sure does get you a lot of free things in the city um, I mean museums and tours and markets and the tea and I mean there's there's it's either discounted or it's free um, because you are a student so uh, the city of Boston is very uh, student heavy in terms of like 60 plus universities or colleges in the in the greater Boston area so that's very affluent in terms of uh of college students in that mindset of I got to save as much money as possible. So you'll fit right in in that. Um, but in terms of saving now, I think it's really one it's, I mean, it's based on what you want af after the program and what you want while you're here. Um, Cause there's an abundance of opportunities to travel and do stuff while you're out on the East coast as well. So it's, it really depends on where you're at financially and what you want to get out of the, um, your time here in Boston. But for, um, for me in particular, I know that leaving here is new opportunity in terms of work, but also I want to get into, house get in by buying a house so it's a big um a big one for us is saving enough money to do that because that was something that we set out to do when we got here so i think it just depends on what your goals are after you leave the program and what you want to do while you're here but there is an abundance of free in boston oh. uh, i was just gonna for me it's uh so prior to coming here we cut all the things that we didn't absolutely need like cable and things like that and now it's really easy because my <laughs> wife just doesn't let me spend money so that's how we do it so i take a very different perspective from everybody else um i'm gonna make a lot more money after this than i made coming in um I, I did save a lot of money um over the first three years but there's only so much you can save so i came in with the perspective that I want to enjoy my time here. Um, I want to meet as many people as possible. And a lot of times for me and my personality, that means going to dinner is going to do things. Um, I take advantage of all the free food while I'm here, but I went out every single day in January um, because we had students, we had students from all the scale centers here. There were over 200 people here. And in order to get to know everybody and, and really introduce them to the MIT lifestyle and everything, I spent a lot of money. Um, and that's okay with me because, you know, I understand, Hey, I invested this much up front. The return on investment is going to be, way higher so um it's it's up to you so if you want it, you don't necessarily have to spend money as much as i did even if you do go out and do stuff a lot um i just have taken on the perspective of this is a cost i'm willing to take on and uh, i'm gonna make it up in the future so it's been worth it uh one more question from the um from the chat was um what role does greek life play for master's students i feel like it's very heavily influenced in the for undergrads um, at MIT, but for graduate students, it's not it doesn't play a huge part, as far as I know. <laughs> we did play against all of them in intramurals, yeah. though. Yeah. In the intramural yeah. football, that that was our interaction with the Greek life. Yeah. They don't stand a chance. <laughs> um, so one last question here that I think I'll close out with is. Um, uh, if somebody takes the MicroMasters uh, online program, can they still apply to the residential program? Um, the answer is actually yes. Um, 
you can apply to both programs. Um, and we have had applicants consider both programs as an option. Um, yeah, and we have several here um, who have done both. Any of the MicroMasters courses will um, set you up um, to succeed in our program here in either the blended or residential. Um, oh, I know. Yes. I was gonna say the same thing. Just say, yeah. So if you do take the MicroMasters and you get into the residential program, uh, it's really advantageous because uh, if you get the permission of your instructor based off the, the grade that you got in the course, you might be able to actually waive that class and then um, participate in something else. So I think it's something that we've all alluded to, but I don't think any of us have actually like outright said it. Um, my, one of my favorite things about MIT is that um, even though you're in the supply chain management program here, you're in the, you're in MIT, which means that you have, all of MIT open to your um, open to you. You can if you're really interested in a class in aerophysics or something like that, then you can take a class in that. I mean, you probably have to convince Robert why it's applicable to what you're trying to do. <laughs> but uh, for me, I've uh, taken a, a quite a few business courses uh, from the Sloan School of Business that have been very very beneficial. So um, if you're able to complete your micro masters and get into the residential program, it just opens you up to those opportunities to take more things that you're interested in. Yeah, and I, I'll just allude to one more thing outside of supply chain since you kind of hit on it a little bit. Uh, I'm pursuing a healthcare certificate that's through Sloan. So that's actually something that uh, I have, I'm passionate about the healthcare industry. I didn't, I have, I have no work experience in it, but this is an opportunity for me if I ever want to make that career pivot. Um, so I would say that a good majority of the courses that I take that have to count for double or I'm duplicating some of my work um, is in the healthcare space, but it's through Sloan. So as Brett alluded to, there's courses amongst all of the different programs that are offered here that you get to take advantage of. And, and Robert's usually pretty nice about having those conversations with you. Now, whether or not it gets approved is a different story, but um, yeah, there's an abundance of stuff here to do. And that's just one example. There's also a sustainability certificate you can get through, uh, through CTL and SCM. So, and the analytics certificate as well. So if you have passions for things, there's actually programs that you can get yourself into that kind of help frame some of the courses you can take because picking is kind of hard sometimes. Um, but that's one more thing. I yeah, I mean, even as a staff member, I've gone to lectures on the TESS Exoplanet Hunting Telescope. Very enlightening. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so and I think with that, we'll wrap up the webinar, unless anybody has any last comments. Um, um, I just want to say that uh, one thing we haven't really talked to as much is all of the great outside speakers that come about a, vi a wide variety of topics. We had the uh, Nobel Prize winners um, of what mathematics of econ here last year, and they spoke. And I've gone to probably twenty different ones. The Netflix founder was here, and he was one of the best presenters I've ever seen. And they're almost always free. Sometimes you get free books. Um, but they're awesome. Um, so that's something that you really don't get at a lot of other universities and you only see in the movies. So if you do come here, <laughs> if you do come here, you can take advantage of that. And it's, yeah, exactly. Your life is a movie if you come here, so. Excellent, so a lot of great selling points to apply. Um, as a reminder, our next application deadline for the residential program is March 1st, uh, May 1st for the blended program. Uh, if you have any questions, email scm at mit.edu and I'll be happy to respond. Um, and thanks again to our panel. Oh, and the blog, uh, the student blog as well. We're having new content published every week, so check it out. Um, and our new website just launched this morning, so take a look. Excellent. Thanks so much. Bye.